Hey everyone. So far in this course, we've explored the concepts of postmodern literary theory and gender performativity in science fiction stories, especially as they relate to the representation of identity. Today, we add a third and final twist to the mix, the concept of translation. Instead of one really long lecture, I'm splitting this one into two parts. In this first lecture, I'll talk about what translation is and why it's very complicated. In the next lecture, I'll talk about what translation has to do with identity. So, what is translation? That question might seem obvious, as we've all probably encountered translation at some point in our lives. But in the interest of being thorough, let's turn to our friend the Oxford English Dictionary. Translation is the action or process of turning from one language into another. Also, the product of this and a version in a different language. Actually, if you visit the OED definition of translation, you'll find that the word encompasses many meanings. For our purposes, we are referring to linguistic translation, but it's important to remember, and we'll talk more about this shortly, that translation also functions as a metaphor for all kinds of transformation. Now, this is a comparative literature course, and translation is a key component to the discipline of comparative literature. As opposed to English or Spanish or any other specific language or literature department, Comparative literature focuses on a variety of texts from a variety of cultural and linguistic backgrounds. In fact, here at this university, if you take a complete course, you're guaranteed to encounter texts in translation, that is, texts not originally written in English. In this course, we've got three main texts in translation. Invisible Planets by Hong Jingfang, which was originally written in Chinese. A Drunken Dream, which was originally written in Japanese by Moto Hagio. And finally, the novel we'll be reading shortly, Stanislaw Lem's Solaris, which was originally written in Polish. There are many reasons we feel it's important to examine literature from a variety of cultural and linguistic backgrounds. Uh, however, two of the most important are to foster linguistic and cultural diversity and to engage an increasingly global scope in our understanding of literature. As we've discussed before, Literature is deeply affected by its authors, language, culture, history, gender, race, etc. Compared to celebrate the almost infinite varieties of these voices, not just within a culture, but also across cultures. Knowing more than one language is a requirement of being part of this comparative literature department. However, we still need translation. For example, I can read English, Japanese, and Spanish. And some of my colleagues also work in Spanish, English, or Japanese, but none of them work in exactly the same language as I do. And on top of that, I have friends and colleagues working in Afrikaans, Russian, French, German, Greek and Latin, Swedish, Bengali, Chinese, Arabic, uh, Turkish, Farsi, Italian, so no one can know all languages, and in order for us to find common ground, we rely on translation. Translation is really complicated, though, especially when it comes to literature. If you have any, if you've used Google Translate, for example, you've encountered how difficult it can be to translate even simple words and phrases. And then once you get into metaphors, puns, and jokes, well, then it gets even trickier. There are plenty of really funny translation fail memes on the internet. Uh, here's one of my favorites. What's particularly funny about this one is that you can see how the translators made the mistake, but their translation is too literal and ends up turning a sweeping romantic claim, you're one in a million, into a rather lackluster line. So translating literature is more complicated than translating a menu or instructions because, as we've discussed throughout the term, Literature creates meaning in a variety of ways, not just in story, but in the beauty and intricacy of its language. So speaking of internet memes, you've probably seen one of those lists of you know, untranslatable words floating around. And if you haven't, Google untranslatable and you'll get a bunch of lists. Those words and phrases that are untranslatable, for example, uh, exemplify the problem of translating literature. When it comes to the practice of translating a text, especially literature, especially literature, translators often explain the tension between a word-for-word -word or meaning-for-meaning -meaning translation versus a sense-for-sense -sense translation. 
Word-for-word -word translation is sometimes called a literal translation. It will make sure that every word and phrase is reproduced as it appeared in the original. While this may seem ideal, it can cause problems. Languages have different grammatical structures, and often a target and a source language won't have the same structures or words. So take, for instance, gendered languages like Spanish or French. Words in English don't have genders, but in Spanish, nouns do. So the word manzana, which is the word for apple, is feminine in Spanish. Uh, the gender of a word will change the way that a word interacts with other words around it, and then obviously create gendered connotations. So while manzana literally translates to apple, you get the meaning, but you might not get the entire sense of the word. Sense for sense translation, on the other hand, is more concerned with capturing the overall feeling and flow of the target text. While sense for sense translators do pay attention to the literal meaning of text, they are sometimes willing to sacrifice a literal translation for one that captures other aspects of the work, like its poetry or sound. Most literary translators bounce between word for word and sense for sense translation. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Most of you probably know about the Japanese poem form called haiku. It's a short poem with three lines. The first and last have five syllables, and the second line has seven syllables. One of the most famous haiku of all time is Basho's frog haiku. Here it is in Japanese. Furuike ya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. Five, seven, five. Now here's the most common English translation. An old pond, a frog jumps in, the sound of water. This is a pretty literal translation by Robert Blythe, but it loses the basic form of the haiku. This one, for example, is three, four, and five syllables. Now here's a translation by Eli Siegel that keeps the five, seven, five. Pond there, still and old. A frog has jumped from the shore. The splash can be heard. Now this poem keeps the form, but, well, Japanese is a concise language, and the haiku is an even more short and concise form of poetry. Now, Blythe's version keeps that sense of concision, even though it does not keep the form of the haiku. Siegel's version keeps the form of the haiku, but has to add words and information to do so. For example, there's nothing about the poem being still in the first line, even though we might deduce that from the details of the poem. It also feels really wordy compared to the Japanese. You can already see how tricky a very short translation can be. And if you'd like to see just how persnickety it can get, I've put a link on Canvas to a site that discusses 30 different translations of the Basho haiku, and these are just from Japanese into English. So before we go, I'd like to address one last point, and I'll start it by asking a question. What do we read when we read translation? Now, you could tell someone that earlier in the course we read Hang Jing Fang's story, Invisible Planets. But did we really read Hang Jing Fang's story? Or did we read the story of her translator, Ken Lu? Or is it some weird combination of both? This gets particularly complicated when we start talking about close reading. Because when we talk about close reading, we're paying close attention to an author's choices about word choice, cadence, metaphor, allusions. But when we read Hang Jing Fang's Invisible Planets, we were actually reading the choices of Ken Lu, her translator. Scholars have very mixed and very intense responses to this question. There are some groups that would argue, while it's not bad to read in translation, you should know that if you're reading in translation, you're not reading the story. You didn't read Invisible Planets. Others, and I'm with them, would argue that to some extent all reading is imperfect and translation is another kind of imperfection. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware of it, and we should understand that our close reading of a text in translation might not necessarily be accurate to the original version. However, this is not a perfect world where we can all understand the beauty and intricacies of all languages. I think it's more important to experience the world's literature, even in a flawed state, than to myopically focus on one corner of the world and its experiences, just because that's the language you know. What do you think? See you next time.